All right, guys, if we would, uh, let's go ahead and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day of grace, and we thank you for the uh, opportunity to get your word out and to understand a few more things about it and to know the security that we have in you and knowing that we can um, trust you and trust your word. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> um, if you all would turn to uh, 2 Corinthians and chapter 13. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I actually, if you were here a couple weeks ago, I taught on this verse. And then I went back and I realized I skipped a bunch of verses. <laughs> you know, so it's like, I wanted to make sure that I got that point across, and I, I didn't, so this is a good opportunity to take, take advantage of that. And, and if you'll go with me to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 and verse 5, <coughs> Paul writing to the Corinthians and to us also, in this verse he says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates but Paul puts forth a couple of uh, challenges here if you want to call it that the first one is he says examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith and that's the one that uh, uh, two weeks ago that I had addressed you know and how we can know the difference between uh, you know the difference between like believing and, and trusting and faith and the, and the things that, that relate to that. And, um, but the second half of that verse says, prove your own selves. And that word prove means to test it. All right, to test it out. And, uh, and, and I, it's a, it's a personal thing to me. I'm sure it's personal to you guys too that you want to know, you want to have that security in knowing that you're saved, right? We can't know, I can't know if you're saved. I can suspect by your actions and stuff, but I can't know for sure whether or not you trusted. I want to know in my own self that I've trusted. Now, there's a couple of things, you know, I want to be secure. I want to know that when I, when I go from this life to the next one, that, I, that I'm on the right, you know, on the right page, right? And that's, I think, what, uh, what he means about prove your own selves. Uh, so in Ephesians chapter 1, go there. And, and <laughs> you guys are, you know, never, it's probably, you don't have to cough until you get up here. And then it's probably like nerves or something, right? And all of a sudden you've got to start coughing. <laughs> so bear with me on that. Anyways, on Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. And we went over these verses two weeks ago. But the thing is, this, it is such a, I, the thing about Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12 and 13, and let's read it, and then I want to, then, then I'll expand on it a little bit. He says, uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12, he said, or not verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, we've read this, we know this verse. We, you know, we've read it. It's a very important verse. I, what I was thinking about this this morning actually was that this verse here is like it, it's a it's a transaction that God has done for us right and not only just a, a, a transaction but have you you know when you buy a house what do you have to do you have to write a contract right and and when you write a contract it means that your intention is to buy this piece of property and and you're you're legally bound to it Right? You know, we all know that a contract's only as good as the person who's signing it, right? But the person making this contract is God. And he's good for his word. 
So what in this in this transaction, he says, in whom ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And I, I take this this verse kind of like takes it it, it kind of like takes the the last part, which is trusted, and puts it in the beginning of the verse. But basically what he's saying is that you hear the words, you come to the word of God and you hear it, and then you, you have a choice once you hear those words. You, you have a choice to believe them or not believe them, right? So you hear the words, you believe the words, and then after that, you, you can trust the word. And I think that's a different, you know... There, there's verses in here that talk about believing and trusting. In 1 Corinthians, he says, um, it saved them that believe, right? So, so the, words, uh, the, the words believing and trusting are kind of, you'll see in Scripture, they're kind of intermingled. But the bottom line is we want to make sure that we are trusting what the words say. You know, we want to come to the words, we believe it, and then we put our trust in it, which is called, I would call that faith, right? That's our faith in Christ. But anyways, this is the transaction that happens. When you do that, when you go through that motion and you put your trust in what God has done uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and the only way we know that is through his word, right? There's no way you can know anything of God except for through his word. Um, once that transaction has happened, we are then given his seal, which is the Holy Spirit. Right, And that Holy Spirit is the thing that solidifies us. It's the thing that, it, as I said before, it's the, st it's the stamp. It's the thing that, that is permanent on us, in us. It is Christ in us. It is the Holy Spirit in us, as the scriptures say, both the, and, and, and God himself inside of us through the Spirit. Uh, and we're going to look at a verse about that. But also... I want to look at just a couple pages over in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. <laughs> Does that make sense? Did, did that make sense to you about, about Ephesians chapter 1? Uh, make sure that I'm making sense. If I'm not making sense, you, you stop me. And I'm a little, you know, uh, you can be a little more casual with me. I'll, you know, answer questions and stuff like that if you want. Um... Or entertain, uh, you know, uh, uh, comments. Um, but in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, he says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we are sealed with that Spirit. We are sealed with the, the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Now, <laughs> that is kind of the, um, that's kind of the groundwork. That is the stuff that we had gone over two weeks ago. All right, but the thing that I wanted to um, elaborate on today is proving. You know, how do we know within ourselves that we have salvation? And he says there in four thirty, he says, he says, um, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, what happens? An amazing thing happens when we trust in what God has done for us all right he takes us and you get that seal and then and and we know we are placed into the body of christ right but then come to romans chapter 15 verse 16 and romans chapter 15 verse 16 <clears throat> Are y'all there? In Romans chapter 15, and we'll start in verse, let's start in verse 15. Paul is writing, and he says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, and this is the purpose, that the offering up the, of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. 
So one thing that happens when we put our trust in Christ is then we are sanctified. And that word to be sanctified means that we're set apart. And I, I see that, I mean, that's what he's doing with the body of Christ. You know, we talk about the church, the body of Christ. We talk about how God places us into the body. Uh, but then I look at it this way. He, he takes us and he separates us, right? We have a, now we have a special purpose. You know, God has a plan for us. Obviously, one of the plans is eternal life, right, with him. Uh, and, that's, and that's our sanctification. But also, he sets us apart. And that's, it's not us that is setting ourselves apart. And that's the thing that we have to understand and realize is that it's not, some, it's not our works, it is God's works. He's the one that sanctifies. And also to sanctify... Um, it says we are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. And to be sanctified means to be made holy or set apart. And, you know, we can't, we can't do anything to make ourselves holy. You know, that is exclusively the work of God himself. We can't, there's nothing that we can do. But the scriptures tell us that when we put our trust in him, we are then made holy. Okay, we are sanctified, we are set apart, we are made holy. So, <laughs> that gets us down to the that gets us down to the understanding of how do I know within myself? Like like Paul said in first uh second Corinthians, how do I know that I'm saved? All right? And that's that's kind of what I wanted to get to right now. Uh, years ago, wow, probably 20 or 25 years ago now, I was actually talking with, um, I was talking with Doug Dodd. And we were talking about sin. And I was having a problem with some sin in my life. And I was struggling with it, right? And I remember him telling me something. He said, uh, you know, we're talking about the struggle uh, the struggle that I was having with this sin. And he said, you know what, though? He said, that's proof that you're saved. You know, because a lost man doesn't struggle with sin, does he? But a saved man does. He struggles with sin. And <coughs> it's not something unique to any one of us. You know, what? What's interesting here is uh, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7. So my question to you is, what is the proof of our salvation? Well, question number one is, does it bother you to sin? Do you have a conflict with sin in your life? Because, like I said before, a lost man doesn't, doesn't care about sin. It doesn't bother him one bit. But a saved man it, it has that conflict within himself. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. And, and I'm going to back you up again. What's that? That's right. He doesn't have a God consciousness to even convict him of his sin. You know, to him, he's just out living in the, you know, doing whatever he wants. Uh, but to us who are, I would say to us who are saved, it creates a real conflict. You know, we, we don't want to... You shouldn't want to be a part of that. When you see sin or you see stuff like that, it is something you want to get away from. Not necessarily, not if you're a, a lost man, you're probably attracted to it, right? But the, here's the thing. Paul says in, uh, the Apostle Paul had the same problem, you know? And I can take comfort in that, knowing that he had this, he had the same conflict. Now he says in, in, um, in Romans, we're going to Romans chapter 7, but what I want to look at is uh, Romans chapter 6. And uh, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And that's in, in verse 1. He says, shall we, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So Paul's in here, he's saying that you know, should we continue in sin? You know, it's almost like you can hear people talking 
today about, oh, uh, if you believe that Christ did it all and you don't have to do any works to, to earn it, then um, um, I guess you can go out and do anything you want then, right? And you hear that argument from people who don't understand, you know, about grace. Is that, oh, if you think that grace and, and, and salvation is free, that means you can go out and do anything you want and there's no penalty for it. You know, you hear that all the time. But Paul answers that question. He says, uh, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So he's saying that we are dead to sin. Paul is dead to sin. But then look at this in uh, Romans chapter 7. If you'll come to Romans chapter 7, and I'm not going to try and read through this because I tried one time. Uh, well, I'll read through it a little bit, but it's like a tongue twist, uh, a tongue twister, right? Do you, this verse here, he says, uh, in, in uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. Now, this is where, this is that really, have you ever read this, have you ever tried to read this verse aloud before? I mean, it's just like, what is, what, what is he talking about? You know, Paul is like, well, we'll read. <laughs> For then if I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Okay, there's a conflict. Paul's talking about the conflict going on within himself. And it's a conflict with sin. Right? He, he's basically saying, I know what the right thing to do and then I don't do it. You know, I... I I know, uh, you know, the thing that I hate, you'll see that in a minute, the thing that I hate, the thing that I don't want to do is the thing that I do, right? C continue on, he says, well, in verse 19, he says, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. You know, what's he talking about? You know, it sounds like he's got a real conflict going on here, doesn't it? <laughs> He says, in verse 20, he says, Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Right? The inward man, the, the spiritual man, the guy inside, the guy that, that the Holy Spirit delights in God's word. And the outward man does not. That's what he's saying. Even Paul's saying this here. You know, he has a conflict with sin. And, well, let's continue on. He says, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so, that, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So basically, he, Paul is talking about that conflict that we have within ourselves. And you know, you, you find that when you're out in the world and, and, and sin presents itself to you, you know what happens? If you're saved, that Holy Spirit works on you, doesn't it? You, you, it, it does it by bringing to mind a verse you know, that comes to mind as, and I, I can't think of a specific example, but I'm just saying that when we were out there and sin presents itself, boom, all of a sudden this verse pops, in your, pop, pops up in your mind and you go, okay, I have a choice to make. I can go ahead and follow after that sin and after the old man, or I can follow after the scriptures, what, what's inside and go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get away from that, right? So if you've experienced that, I have, <laughs> you know, congratulations, you probably are saved, right? <laughs> so that's point number one. If you have a conflict with sin, uh, I think that is uh, like, like Paul says, prove it, you know, what, what is the proof? What is an understanding, a proof of your salvation? That's one, point one. Point number two, 
Um, this is a good one. The, is God's word illuminated when you read it? Right? And hopefully you spend some time, you know, meditating on the scriptures. And you spend some time reading it and you get into it. And, and have you ever been, uh, you know, reading along in something and just all, all of a sudden the lights start going on? Right? And, and you start understanding some things. And, you know, you can get it in the preaching too. You know, you hear things, you hear the Word of God, and you get an understanding of what he, you know, how he's working today and what he's doing. But when you get in and start reading it, and you're, you're, you know, you're alone, you're reading it by yourself, and you start understanding some things. And, you know, I've had it happen, you know, in my life quite a few times where you're reading some, some verses and you're going, Wow! Look at that. You know, look at what God's doing here. You know, and a lost man doesn't have that. Right? He's not going to get the benefit of God's Word. He can read it, but it doesn't, it's not illuminated. And that's a, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, Paul's writing here, he says, um, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Okay, so he says, in, in verse 9 he says, uh, he's, quoting, he's quoting an Old Testament verse. He says, we can't understand it. But he says in verse 10, he says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So let me kind of break that. Well, I'll break it down at the end. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And, and we tend to understand that that's comparing verses with verses, right? Because those are the spiritual things that we're talking about. We're, we, we compare verse with verse to understand some things about God. But verse 14, he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So, basically, this section of, of Scripture is saying that um, God has revealed himself to us through his word. And that if you have the spirit of God in you, which is that Holy Spirit that Ephesians talks about, right? The transaction that happens in Ephesians where we receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. If you have that seal of the Holy Spirit, now you can come to God's word and you can understand the things that he's talking about. And that, ha and that happens when you come and read it. Now it says, but the natural man, the, the lost man, uh, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. And so a, a lost man can come and read the word, but it's not going to speak to him. And, and we've, we've seen evidence, you know, we've heard evidence of that in the past where where, you know, an atheist or somebody can read the Scriptures, but they, they can understand about what Christ has done, but they haven't applied it to themselves. So they can't understand and know the deep things that God has revealed through His Word. So I think that, I mean, that's a, to me, that's a, um, a relief. You know, when, when I'm coming to the Word and I'm reading things and things are becoming illuminated, you know, I'm like, hey... That's cool. That's the spirit working, right? You know, and I, I you know, I, I'm secure in understanding that, I, you know, in my salvation, right? 
I can, I can rest in that. When I see these things happening, I can say, hey, there's a proof. There's the proving that Paul is talking about in, in Corinthians. And the third thing, are you comforted by the words, by the word in hard times, right? Now, I think that that is a special benefit that we get by understanding God's word. You know, by having that comfort, having the security of knowing that, um, that God is not going to leave us, right? And, and I, I loved what you were, we had the men's breakfast yesterday, and I loved what Robert was saying, that he was talking to a lost man. He's like, you know, I don't know how you can go through life. You know, we used, you actually said that you were, would you say you were... Um, admired him that's the word I was looking for <laughs> he admired this this guy because he had to go through everything alone right he had no support he had no he had to deal with everything in himself and we have the comfort of knowing that we have Christ in us so that everything that we might have to come across if we find out that some bad medical news or we find out you know we find something out uh, that nobody wants to find out in their life, we have comfort knowing that Christ will never leave us. Right? Like those verses that we read that uh, even death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Right? So we can have that comfort. And that comfort, and, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he talks about that. That's the, the verse about the, um, the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <laughs> we don't have to read the whole verse. I just want to hit a couple of the verses that are, are important. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And, but jump down to verse 18 where he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words and I think we you know when we experience the passing of a loved one uh, and we understand that they were you know we have an all um, um, ex understanding that they were saved right we can have comfort in knowing that you know that God has a plan for them beyond this life you know and we can have that security we can have that comfort also in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 says that blessed be God even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of mercies and the God of all comfort verse 4 who comfort us comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we were I'm sorry get a little tongue tied wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God and and we do that through through the scriptures we do that by coming to and coming to reading and understanding the words on the page and then when some and you know we might go through some troubles and tribulations in ourselves but we take comfort through the words that God has given us. But not only that, now we can comfort those around us that might be going through a similar problem or circumstance. So anyways, uh, that just a uh, a couple of a couple of points to understanding, you know, I mean, if you, I think we all have to um, do some inspect, some, some soul searching, if you want to call it that. We do some soul searching to inspect the things that we're trusting in. We will make sure that we're trusting in the right words, right? The words of God. Um, but Paul says, test it out. And you might even find that you have uh, comfort. And, you know, I have comfort in knowing and understanding 
that when I go from this life into the next one, that God has a plan and a purpose for me. Um, but not only then, but now we understand that he gives us strength and security when we have to go through hard times. Yeah, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that. All right. I'm done, Bruce. <laughs>